Hey everyone, welcome back to Bagel TCG, and today we're going to be doing our Outsiders Class of Constructed card review. It's going to be a bit of a longer one. I'm going to go through all of the new cards that are coming out from Outsiders, so not looking at any, any older ones. I'm going to be trying to look at them through the context of the Class of Constructed format, making some predictions about the power level of each card and its impact on the metagame. Just to review the scale, um, we've got one as unplayable, two meaning fringe, uh, probably won't show up much, but might have a few applications. Um, three is when we start seeing cards in decks, uh, so playable cards. One and two means if I'm writing it, it's not a great card and you probably won't see it in Classic Constructed. Um, four is above rate. This is a card you'll probably see pretty often, especially, you know, obviously in the archetype that it's made for. And it's going to be a, a very good card for that deck. Um, and then five it is not going to be a, a common number for me to attribute to a card, but it means meta-defining, uh, basically like a card that other decks have to think about, right? Like if it's a card that is like Crown of Seeds, Rampart, Whale, um, like super powerful stuff that other decks have to consider during their deck building, you know, Blizzard, Channel Lake Frigid, Anything that's like, oh, when I'm building my deck, I actually have to think about this card or this mechanic, um, and it's affecting other decks. That's meta-defining, right? Four is like, this card's really good in my deck, but like other decks aren't going to sit there and plan around that card that much. So that's kind of the difference between those two categories, but four and five, obviously both very good. Um, and if a card's getting either score, you, you would see it a ton in, in the deck it's made for. But these are going to be the different categories I'm giving cards here. And uh, let's kind of hop right into it. Um, first, we're going to be, you know, I'm just going in the order of the Flesh and Blood website. I've got six I was able to fit on each page here. Um, starting with Azuri, I gave Azuri a three. Uh, a lot of the testing I've seen, she's been okay. Um, you know, her hero power is fine. It, it, you technically, like, lose a resource in a way to use it. Obviously, the surprise factor is pretty nice. And you're able to sneak out some pretty powerful effects. Um, against any kind of more controlling deck, I don't see it being super powerful. Like, sneaking something out on them like that isn't that crazy. Um, against the, you know, like, aggro decks, it might mess with them a little if you, you know, if they block with one card and then get blown out after that. But overall, it's not the strongest hero ability we've seen. And the assassin card pool is still just kind of so-so. Um, looking at the weapons here, uh, once again, these scores are like in the context of Assassin, right? So while I don't think any of these weapons are great because two resources for one damage with Goian is pretty bad, um, you know, Orbito Class and Scale Peeler are pretty good for Assassin, right? Like those are pretty solid weapons. Orbito Class is going to be great into certain matchups when you want to decrease the block of their non-attacks and Scale Peeler is probably the strongest one. Um, you probably want to usually have one scale peeler because a lot of the times if you're attacking with break points, like four, um, your opponent's going to be trying to use equipment to make up for those break points. So against like an aggro deck, they use their equipment a lot to block with a card for three and then block the fourth point of damage on like your leave no witness. Um, and you can really mess with that with scale peeler. So scale peeler is pretty good. Um, Orbito class is pretty good as well in the matchups. Nerve Scalpel, I don't think you're going to care too much about decreasing the defense of the reactions. Um, that maybe is good, like, specifically against Dorinthia. But unless Dorinthia is, like, the king of the meta, which I do think she's going to be very good, um, unless she's the queen or the king of the meta or whatever, I, I don't think uh, Nerve Scalpel is going to be the, the played weapon. It's probably Spider's Bite, the dagger we already have, that affects attack actions, or Beto Class, and then definitely Scale Peeler. Looking at chests here, uh, we've got the new Redback Shroud. This is a new chest piece for Assassin, and I think it's pretty good. I gave it a score of three for playable. Um, it's kind of interchangeable with Tunic a little. It's pretty nice because you can block with it and then use the effect, so you're usually going to get at least two points of value from it, um, which is, you know, Tunic, you're going to usually get at least two points of value from it. Ideally three from Tunic, but you can get this back. And then once you get Redback, Redback Shroud back, it's kind of four points of value, right? So um, pretty good. Um, not like way better than Tunic. It's probably equal. Um, but it's pretty nice because you can do a hand with like attack 
pitch a blue to attack with a two cost attack, then use this to play the pummel. Um, just exactly like how Tunic does, but I guess the reverse is that you can block with this one first, whereas Tunic you would block with it later. So, uh, not like I said, not that different, but it's pretty good. Um, infiltrate here. This card is, like, it seems really good because it's kind of drawing you a card, but it turns out Flesh and Blood decks are very synergistic. Like, most decks are really trying to synergize with themselves. And a lot of the times when I was playing this, the card I stole, like, wasn't good and it wasn't worth me pitching for or playing. Um, if it made the card, like, free, maybe it'd be better. In certain matchups, this is going to be solid. Like, against ninjas, you can probably just play, like, half of their head jabs for free, and that's pretty good. Um, but in a lot of matchups, like, if you're stealing a Thunderquake from Guardian, you might not even draw two blues until on your next turn. Like, it's it's very situational. Um, but it's a stealth attack, and I think all the stealth attacks are going to get, like, a two or a three because there is zero for three that blocks three, and they interact with your hero. So... None of them are that bad. Um, I am only like rating the reds if it's uh, none of the you know infiltrates a majestic, so it's just this one. But I'm just rating like the reds. But the score kind of goes for the rest of it, right? Like maybe the blue is good too. The yellow is probably not as good, but the card in general is going to get that score. Um, and then you can kind of do with it what you will for the other colors. Um, it would take <laughs> a lot of slides to rate every color, um, but. Next, we've got the Azuri Specialization. This is probably one of the main reasons to play Azuri, especially over Arachne, because I do think Arachne's hero ability is maybe slightly better. Like, it's a little more consistent disruption on the opponent, just being able to, uh, like, get rid of their good cards to the bottom of their deck or keep them on top if you know you're going to be able to hit and banish them. You get a little more control of your opponent's game plan as Arachne with that, with that hero ability, but... Shakedown is a is definitely a huge reason to play Azuri. Um, on hit, you choose a color, opponent reveals their hand, and you banish a card of the chosen color. Uh, obviously, you have to have activated or played a reaction, an attack reaction, but um, you know you can make that happen. Your hero ability does that if you cheat it out with this, or um, you can activate like most of your equipment is reactions, and that counts as that. So I give this one a four. It's, uh, it's going to be one of the better cards for the Azuri deck. And like I said, it's probably one of the main reasons to play Azuri. Uh, and last of the Assassin Majestics here, we've got Spreading Plague. This one gets a fringe score. Uh, I think in certain matchups, this could be huge. Like if you are against a control deck and you throw a big attack at them for nine or something, right? And they block with three cards, you get to deal like an extra six damage to them for one resource, right? Because... They're not going to be able to pay for it because they just blocked with a bunch of cards. You get to pay a resource here and give them three Blood Rot Pox tokens. That's pretty good. Um, but against decks that don't want to block you, like, this does nothing, right? So uh, it's, it's mostly good against, like, blockout decks. And so it's probably just a sideboard piece. And unless it's, like, a very, very good sideboard piece, it's just going to get a two for the most part. Um, next, we've got Backstab here. Backstab. Oh, I'm over the score i just realized let me move myself down a little there we go okay uh so yeah the orbito class had a four as well there i think it was not shown but um back to here backstab gets a three um like i said a lot of the stealth cards are just going to get threes uh this one i actually think is one of the better stealth cards because there are reactions that care about um stealth cards like you can see the spikes both right down here um, backstab says defense reactions can't be played to its chain link, so it's actually pretty good on its own. Um, you can like two card hand backstab and then use tunic or um, the new chest piece to play one of these one cost reactions, and they can't react in response, um, which is pretty good because they have to overblock then to predict your reaction, or you just get the reaction off. Um, so I think this is like probably excuse me. This is probably in the like three best reactions, right? Um, probably in the three best reactions. Sorry, not reactions, stealth cards. Uh, I was thinking about the reactions that's going to be played on it. Um, probably in the three best stealth cards uh, that Azuri can play. I think if you're playing Azuri, you're almost definitely putting Backstab in your deck. Um, you could even play a blue one, and it's not that bad. You probably do want to play some number of blue stealth cards, because then you can use them when you have like a blue flooded hand to cheat out uh, 
those two cost attacks with Uzuri Hero, Hero ability. Um, next we have Sneak Attack. Uh, this is probably going to be pretty good in Limited, but for Classic Constructed, it's just a 2 for 7, um, which is like fine. I mean, that's like slightly above rate, right? Like 2 for 6 is what we're usually seeing. Um, but there's no like on hit. I would much rather have one less damage and, and then make my opponent discard a card, like Shakedown right above it. So I don't think it's going to see any play at all. Um, we'll just give it a 1. We've got Spike with Blood Rot. This one's pretty good. It's really nice that these Spike reactions block for 3. That's awesome to have a reaction blocking for 3. Um, and this one kind of is a 1 for 5 damage. Like, it's really good. I think this one, if anything, gets like a 3.5. Maybe it's like closer to a 4 because, uh, you know, 1 cost to give a stealth card plus 3 and a Blood Rot Pox on hit is, is 1 for 5 damage in this scenario. Um, obviously synergizes really well with backstab right above it um but it's like it's it's good but i don't think it's solving azuri's problem azuri's one of her bigger problems is that she doesn't get go again that well especially on her own assassin cards there's not a lot of assassin cards at all with go again um so she's gonna need to be mixing in a lot of uh like generic or hybrid go again um if she wants to be doing that at all if you're just trying to go tall with reactions, this card's pretty good. Um, and then Frailty, Spike with Frailty is next to it. Um, this one gets a slightly lower score because I think Frailty is probably the weakest of the tokens, um, at least in the current metagame. You know, Blood Rot, straight two damage is pretty good for an on hit. Frailty is like situational against some heroes, it's really good. Um, like ninjas with Kodachis or assassins with their daggers or rangers with a lot of cards from Arsenal. Um, but in some matchups, it's almost entirely useless um so kind of situational there right and so i'll just give it a two for fringe meaning you know certain matchups it'll be good next we've got spike with inertia uh this is another three just like blood rot i think inertia and blood rot are kind of close in terms of power i think blood rot might be slightly better than inertia um but inertia is quite good right now because it's so strong against icelander um, and Icelander is like one of the best decks. It's not that bad against Oldham either. Um, and then it's pretty good into like all of the uh, Rangers right now that are going to be seeing play. So Inertia is pretty good. I'll give a Spike with Inertia's three as well. Um, getting to the common stealth cards here. I gave Infect a four, meaning it's going to probably see play in every Missouri deck. Um, it's effectively a zero for five. Um, most people aren't going to be paying three resources to pay for a Blood Rot. Um, so if this gets through zero for five damage, that blocks three is quite good. Isolate, um, kind of similarly to a backstab that we just saw here. It's kind of a weaker backstab in the sense that it makes it harder for your opponent to react on it. So if you're using a spike with inertia on isolate, that it has dominate, which makes it a little harder for them. Um, but you know, if they have a reaction arsenal, they can still get around that. The other synergy, um, with Isolate, and the reason it has a 3 and, and is playable and probably going to be played in a lot of Azuris is that they can only block with one card um, from hand. So when you react in a card from uh, your hand with Azuri's hero ability, um, you know, they've only blocked with one card. So your 6 is probably going to hit unless they have a reaction in Arsenal or something like that. Or if they overblocked, which you're probably okay with anyways. So Isolate, we'll give it a 3 for playable. Um, I like the effect on it. The next two, Malign and Prowl, they get twos, probably some of the weaker stealth cards. Um, we don't care that much about damage uh, can't be prevented on this. I mean, most decks don't use damage prevention currently. And then Prowl giving our next stealth attack, plus one. This will be really good in limited for young Arachne or in Blitz for young Arachne. Um, but, I mean, it doesn't really, like... We're not going again that much, and you would have to find a way to give Prowl go again with Azuri. Um, and there's there's not that many ways to do it effect like efficiently. So we'll just give it a two here for not that p powerful in especially classic constructed where there's no young Arachne. Um, so date, I'm gonna give it another four inertia. I talked a little bit earlier about how good inertia tokens are right now with um, Icelander and Rangers and Oldham. And it being pretty good in general, so Inertia Token is a nice on hit. Um, maybe not exactly two points of value like a Blood Rot Poxes. This one's a little more fluctuating. 
it's sometimes more than two points of value if you're making your opponent discard a card fully um, that you know they just had to keep, but sometimes it does nothing. So still give it a four because I think it's probably one of the other stealth cards you're always going to play. Um, in my mind, I imagine like you're playing three infects, three sedates, and then three backstabs at least. So at least those nine stealth cards, and then maybe like three isolates as well. So then you have twelve red stealth cards. Um, so that, that's kind of what I imagine there. Um, and then we've got Wither. This one gets a slightly lower score than its counterparts because I'm not as high on frailty tokens. And then Razor's Edge gets a two, uh, mostly because I don't think we're trying to like really pump our stealth cards that much. And this one doesn't give an on hit either. I do love that it's a three block again on a reaction, um, but it's uh, like plus three for zero is nice. It's just... I don't think we're like a deck that's trying to pump our stealth cards a bunch. We're trying to switch our stealth cards out for our two cost attacks with our hero ability. And it has pretty bad synergy with our hero ability, right? Because if we pump a stealth card, we don't want to switch it anymore because we would lose this whole effect. So um, yeah, it's not it's not that high synergy with uh, Zuri. Maybe better, I would say it would be better in Arachne, but it wouldn't even be better in Arachne because he doesn't want to use, or they don't want to use stealth as much, right? So Maybe like specifically young Arachne and draft, it'll it'll be good, um, but not that playable overall. Um, I think we're done with the straight assassin cards here. We're sixteen minutes in, so this is going to definitely be a longer video. Um, oh, I think I skipped a page there. Nope. Um, but we're gonna hop into the ninja cards here, um, starting with Mask of Many Faces. Gave this one a two. Uh, I just don't think it's going to be better than Pouncing Links or um, Momentum. Like, if this was your only mask available to Ninja, like, sure, it's pretty fine. It, it probably is pretty cool to make your combo lines happen. Um, but, I mean, Momentum's amazing. Pou mask of the Pouncing Links is amazing. I'm still going to give it a 2 and not a 1, just because there's maybe something really cool, like, cool combo that I haven't thought of yet with its ability. It does have a very interesting ability, so I'll give it a 2 for Fringe. I can't really commit to giving it a one just because it might be good. But moving on to Cyclone Roundhouse, this one gets just a three. I hate it that it's yellow. I hate that it's a two cost. Um, neither of those things are great for Katsu, but it has a really nice combo effect. Um, it says banish a random defending card from each chain link. If your opponent has blocked with like battle worn equipment, if they blocked with rampart stuff like that earlier in the chain, it will banish those cards, assuming they're like the randomly selected one. But if it's the only thing they blocked with on that chain, like if you attack with a Kodachi and then they use rampart to block it, you can just banish the rampart, right? So I feel like this card might be necessary even in the older matchup. Um, so I'm gonna give it a three for playable. It's not a bad card anyways. Um, and I think it's fine. It's just not like exactly what we want to be doing, right? Next up is Dishonor. This is our first five, I believe. Uh, this card's on hit is pretty insane. It's one of the earlier cards we saw, I think. And uh, yeah, it, it says, when this hits a hero, if you control Surging Strike, Descendant, Gust Wave, and Bonds of Ancestry, that hero loses all abilities for the rest of the game, right? So, um, like, when you're pairing into Castle, you're going to have to think about, like, can I block out Dishonor? Like, am I capable of stopping them from getting the Dishonor combo off? And what am I doing if they can't get it? Like, what if I'm, what am I doing if they can get it off, right? Like, if they connect with Dishonor, can I win this game still without my hero ability? And for a lot of heroes, that's going to be no. Like, a lot of heroes can't win without their hero ability. Icelander is pretty dead without her hero ability a lot of the times. Viserai is going to be a lot weaker without his hero ability. Briar is going to be a lot weaker. Five, like These heroes can exist without their hero ability, but it's going to be a very uphill battle at that point, losing like the main mechanic of your deck, right? So um, very good card. Uh, I expect it to be one of the reasons Katsu is winning games from now on. Um, and the new cards with it, Descendant, Gust Wave, and Bonds of Ancestry, are also quite good, you'll see. Um, so I think this card's a five. I think this will breathe a lot of life back into Katsu having a... You know, at the end of the chain here is zero for four that has one of the deadliest on hits we've ever seen in Flesh and Blood. Next, what we got head leads the tail. This one gets a three just for playable because it's basically a one for four. It's just head jab um, because you know you'll pick a card that's going to get plus one, 
and it's going to get at least plus one. Um, I do think this card's pretty huge for Kitty Katsu or whatever it's called with the Crouching Tigers. It's going to be nice there. I could even see it in Fi with Phoenix Flames, getting a bunch of Phoenix Flames pumped up. Um, I don't think I don't think Kitty Katsu is going to be the main version with Crouching Tigers. If Crouching Tiger Katsu was the main version, I would probably give this card a four because it's going to be definitely played as a three of in that deck. Um, but I don't think Combo Katsu is going to be playing it. So I'm just going to give it a three for now. Um, this next one kind of awkward because uh, it's not a classic constructed card. Benji's not legal in classic constructed. I gave it a five because uh, <laughs> you can actually just grab Dishonor with it. Um, and then you can make it, you can line up your cards in a way with Benji um, so that you have an unblockable combo line in which Dishonor is unblockable. You can like uh, play Bonds of Ancestry do something after Bonds of Ancestry and then play Dishonor. And then it still checks like everything's on the chain link. It just won't get the plus two, but without the plus two now, Dishonor is unblockable with Benji. And then you just get through with it, right? So um, I think this card's pretty great. Uh, you know, it's, it's really good for Benji. I don't, I'm not really making this deal this for Blitz though. So I'll give it like a five with a question mark. I think it's the only question mark on here because it's not a classic constructed card. Um, Silverwind Shuriken gets a 1. It is a card that is does not block and does not have go again. So I have no idea when you're playing this other than turn 0. And I don't really want to put a card in my deck that's like just for turn 0. Unless it blocks for 3 as well. And this one doesn't do that, so we'll give it a 1. Next up we've got Visit the Floating Dojo. This is a new Katsu specialization, but... Uh, it wasn't great. The other problem with this one is that it doesn't block. And Katsu would really like his blue cards to all be three block combo cards to synergize with Flick Flack. And also, if you ever draw like a double blue hand, you're often going to want to block with one of them. Um, so, you know, I'd really like this card to block. I gave it a two because you might sideboard one or two of these. They're probably pretty nice into like fatigue decks or like really slow decks where this kind of lets you set up a bigger turn. But especially against aggro decks, this card's going to lose you more games than it's going to win you. Um, and then we've got another 5. Uh, I guess this one doesn't deserve a 5 in the sense that other decks aren't going to have to think about Bonds of Ancestry as much. But it's just so good. It's just so good. That, like, I guess the sense is that other decks are going to have to think about it because they're going to have to be like, how can I out damage or beat this card? Because it's just so strong, right? If... A card with Gust Wave is the last attack this combat chain. This costs two less, and it has go again. So now it's a zero for four go again. Already great. And it has, when this attacks, you banish a card with combo from your graveyard. Then you search your deck for a card with the same name, banish it, then shuffle. And you can play at this combat chain. That is not an on hit. That's an on attack trigger. You basically just draw a card when you attack with it. So it's like just ten times better than Snatch if you're getting the effect off. It's a... Zero for four, go again, three block, draw a card on attack. Like that is just mind boggling. When I'm, I've been testing Katsu most, like the most out of any of these heroes, and I'm playing like the reds and the yellows of this card. <laughs> it's just so good. And the main reason I'm playing the yellows is because I've, I play through all three of my reds and I'm like, I want more. Like I need more of these because I'm playing it so much. This card's just very, very good. If it was an on hit, it would be a lot weaker. And it'd probably be like a three, but they just made it an on attack trigger. So it's absurd. They can't even ice react it away. It goes into your banish zone. <laughs> it's like so good. And <laughs> this card's are really, really nuts. And uh, this plus dishonor is like why Katsu is probably going to be good again. I'm really hoping he's good again because he was like my first hero and I love Katsu. So um, yeah, this card's insane. Uh, next card, not as insane. Recoil. It doesn't have go again. Where the heck is the go again? I love a three block. Zero for three is a fine rate. It has a great on hit if you played head jab before it, but a great on hits on a three power attack is not ideal. We would love for our on hits to be on four power, like break points. Um, not super happy here. They can just put a three block in front of it, and now you've like, I mean, that's fine. You traded a card for a card, but you'd like to be trading a card for two cards kind of thing, so... Give it a two. It's a, it's a nice on hit, but I don't see it working out that much. And I would have loved for it to have go again. Spinning Wheel Kick. This card's pretty good. I'll give it playable. 
it's just leg tap, one for four go again. Um, but it has synergy with itself um, where it, it says, you know, if you've played another twin twisters or spinning wheel kick before it, it gets plus one. And when it hits, put it on the bottom. So now it's a one for five that will put itself back in the deck, which is pretty nice. Um, and this is the card that goes with, you know, the Cyclone Roundhouse here in the top middle. Um, that was pretty good. We talked about into decks that are blocking with their equipment. So it's kind of a must anyways, but they're both playable. That's pretty nice. Next up, we have Back Heel Kick. This is another zero for three that blocks three that doesn't have go again and like has an okay effect. I don't really like any of the Twin Twisters lines. I don't even... Like, I, I, I am testing with Spinning Wheel Kick, but I just don't have Twin Twisters in that deck because it's it's not great. Like, I'm just fine with the Spinning Wheel Kick on its own. Um, so this card's... I don't, I don't like it. It's it's just whatever. Um, if you're, like, buffing its power, it's still just a 0 for 4. That's, like, not that... Or 0 for 5, I guess. It's it's whatever. The Twin Twisters has to hit, too. So it's not great. Be Like Water, though, is really good. This card's great. You probably play more than just the reds. Um, basically, it's like a discounted surging strike if it hits. And worst case scenario, it's a head jab. And like head jab is not the best card in the game, but it is far from the worst card in the game. Zero for three go again is like totally fine in Ninja. We're not mad about zero for three go again. And then it has the potential to be way better. If we can get it to hit, you pay a resource. And now it says its name is surging strike, which is like our best combo lines, right? All of our best combos are surging strike. And then you paid one resource for three damage for a Surging Strike. That's pretty good. It's like a cheaper version of the blue Surging Strike there. And if it doesn't hit, you just had them trade a card for a card, and that's like fine. That's whatever. Um, so I'm pretty pretty happy with this card. Um, you can also turn it into a Head Jab or a Twin Twisters. I don't really like any of the Head Jab lines that much. The Twin Twisters, especially because now it's a more expensive Head Jab, right? Twin Twisters, it's like a slightly weaker Twin Twisters, right? Because you're just it's just Twin Twisters without the effect of Twin Twisters. But head, Surging Strike is the best one because you're getting a discount on the effect now, right? So I'm giving it a 4 just because it's so flexible. You can play like Spinning Wheel Kick in that line, um, not play Twin Twisters and play Be Like Water. So really, really good card for Katsu. Last Ninja cards here. Deadly Duo gets a 1, mostly because it's just a bad leg tap it's a one for three go again with a pretty solid on hit if it hits it it's a one for five but your opponent can just put a three in front of it and then you're just not that happy about it so i'm gonna give it a one i don't think this card's gonna see any play um if it costs zero like uh there's a card that's escaping my mind right now that five plays because it's a zero for three go again if it hits your next two or less space power gains go again that card's pretty good but it it's like almost the same effect in the sense that it's a nice zero. It's a nice three power go again with a good on hit, but this one just costs one resource instead of zero. So I'm not, I don't expect it to see play, especially in CC. Descending gust wave. This is um, the new gust wave. This is required to be played for this the dishonor line, um, but I think it's good. It's pretty good. I'm giving it a four for above rate. Uh, you know, if surging strike is before it costs one less and has plus two. So it is a zero for five go again, if you've played Surging Strike before it. Um, the really amazing thing here is that it has go again on its own. So you can play it as like a weaker leg tap, you know, just one for three go again, um, which isn't great. You know, you'd like to play zero resources for that, but then you'll have the combo effect already for Bonds of Ancestry, which is immediately increasing your value because you now have a zero for four go again draw card on attack. Um, so you just get all that all that disadvantage of playing, paying a one for three go again back when you play the Bonds of Ancestry. So like the card's great. It synergizes you know perfectly, obviously with Bonds of Ancestry. It's lovely that it has go again on its own, and a zero for five go again is really powerful. Um, I wish it blocked for three, but I think they thought it would be almost all combo cards block for three. Basically all of them block for three, but I'm pretty sure they knew this would be too good if it blocked for three. So uh, yeah, only blocks for two. That's like the only downside I can really think of. Um, and then one two punch is another head jab combo card. Once again, it blocks for three. It has an on hit, but it only attacks for three. So they're just gonna block it. I wish it had go again. Get to two for fringe. We're at 30 minutes now. So it looks like we're taking about 15 minutes per hero. So this is probably gonna be an hour long video. Um, thank you for sticking it out if you're still here. 
if you're still here, I guess I'll know. Answer in the comments what you think is going to be the strongest hero. And uh, I guess say I was there. I'm just interested to see who's still here at this point. Let me know what hero you think is going to be, uh, I guess I should specify, in this set, right? Like, in these six heroes, who's going to be the strongest hero coming out of it in Classic Constructed? And just say, like, I was there. I'm interested to see who's still watching and what hero you think is going to be the strongest in Classic Constructed out of these six um, once we go into it. So I guess not out of these six because Benji is Blitz. Out of these five. Um, but let's hop right into Ranger here. We've got Riptide. Uh, Riptide, I think I just don't understand. To be honest, I think I don't understand him. I'm going to give him a two. Um, he starts with 38 health. His effects, like the on the trigger from a trap dealing a damage directly is really nice. The reload seems pretty nice, but he's a ranger. Rangers are so bad. Like rangers are not good heroes for the most part. Lexi is like kind of the exception because she has Voltaire and Voltaire is busted for a bow, but uh, none of the, he doesn't get Voltaire and neither does Azalea. And I just don't see either of them doing great currently. I really, 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 really want to be proven wrong because I think he looks super cool. I love his style. I love his art. I like blocking with cards and having them deal direct damage to the opponent. I think it's all really sick. Um, but he's... I just haven't been able to figure him out yet. And so I'm just going to give him a two. Not great. Um, but I will... This is the thing I would like to be proven wrong the most about on the whole tier list. I would love for Riptide to be like S tier and I'm playing Riptide because I would be on that. Currently... Not as much faith in Riptide in the, the like, you know, 20 games of testing I've done. Barb Castaway gets a three. It's playable. It's nice that it's an instant and you can activate it on your opponent's turn. It has some synergy with New Horizon. You can do it like turn zero kind of stuff with it. Um, so it's a three. It's not bad. It's not Voltaire, which would be a four probably. Um, but this is this gets a three. Um, Trench also gets a three. I love some CNC protection. Uh, it feels somewhat necessary in Riptide because of uh, if you ever get like a trap stuck in Arsenal, sometimes you just can't play your turn. <laughs> like you, you have no way to play cards with that are arrows if you have a trap stuck there and you didn't use it. Um, so you kind of need Trench to get rid of that. Uh, and so it does feel somewhat necessary. Uh, maybe it should have a four then because it's like feels kind of required in Riptide. Um, but maybe you only need to do that once per game and then his quiver is fine in that spot and you'd rather play uh, Tunic. Um, this is probably like one of my favorite arts of any equipment in this set. I think the art is really cool in this card and I'm excited to see the extended art, but that is not what we're rating here. So I'll give it a three for playable because I think Riptide is probably going to need it. Another five here, Quiver of Abyssal Depths. Um, Rangers have a big problem with having no weapon. And so they get fatigued pretty easily because they have no way to, like once they're out of deck, they can't do anything. They can't like just pitch cards to attack with a hammer. They're just out of stuff to do. So getting a free remembrance, basically, like you just start with this remembrance, you just pitch a blue at some point and you get a play remembrance. You're not even down a card from your 60 in deck. is really good. This card's huge. It's going to make fatiguing rangers that much harder and it might make it too hard. You play this, and you play three Remembrances, and now you have 12 extra cards in your deck. Well, Remembrances are kind of plus two. You So you have six, but you have nine extra cards in your deck, right? So really good right there, and uh, I don't think you're going to play three Remembrances, but anyways, a free Remembrance on your Quiver is pretty good, and I think any deck that was trying to block out Ranger is uh, going to have to rethink that strategy with Quiver of Abyssal Depths. Quiver of Rustling Leaves. I will give a four. Uh, the reason it's above rate, the effect is not great. It's like pitching a card to draw a card, kind of like Gorg Tome, I guess. Um, one time use, not great. The main thing is that quivers are free. Like these are an equipment slot that you didn't have before, that you now have. And this is probably going to be the one Lexi plays because she only has access to this in Abyssal Depths. So probably play both and then just have Abyssal Depths in the sideboard. Um, but it's not bad. I, I was play testing earlier. I had a Ranger against me. Pitch a blue. They were like, I was winning, right? And I get them down to one card. Usually Ranger can't do anything on one card in hand. But they pitch a blue, activate Quiver, and they have a zero cost arrow on top that gets loaded into their arsenal. And they're able to shoot it at me and just throw the tempo back. Because we were one at life, one life. And I thought I was going to win because they couldn't stop. They couldn't do anything with one card, right? But Quiver Rustling Leaves throws the tempo back there. Like... 
it's pretty good. It's somewhat of a Hail Mary sometimes, but if you're able to opt, it's not as much of a Hail Mary. And uh, sometimes Hail Marys are worth it, especially when it's a free slot. So I will say play it like, you know, play it above raid. This is something Ranger didn't have before that they have now. And if Ranger is going to be better than I think it is, which I hope it is, I think Quiver of Rustling Leaves is going to be what at least Lexi and maybe the others are going to be playing as well. Azalea Specialization Quiver here. Crow's Nest, I'll give it a three. Being able to like pitch extra resources into getting bonus effects from aim counters is pretty nice. Um, I don't know how great the aim counter effects are going to be. The only one I've seen so far that seems really good is Barbed Undertow. Uh, playing aim counters, is it good enough just for that effect? I don't know. I guess Dead Eye is pretty good too. But uh, yeah, maybe you play it just for when you draw either of those two cards, in which case it's fine. Um, but it's nothing like that's going to blow me away, and, and not every ranger can play it. It's probably pretty good in Azalea, but it's not going to be doing anything crazy in the CC meta. Um, I'll give Driftwood Quiver here, Riptide's Specialization a 2. It's just like a bad version of the chess piece I just showed, and uh, why wouldn't you just play the chess piece and like the Quiver of Rustling Leaves? I'm not sure really, but maybe this is what you end up playing and you play Tunic instead, but I don't, I don't know. I think this is like... You're just down a card, but you don't even get anything for it. The other one at least gives you a resource. And this is only a one-time effect. And there's not there's more than one CNC in your opponent's decks usually. So, uh, yeah. I, I I think I'd prefer the chess piece. But I'll give this one a two because maybe you play Tunic and then this instead. Wayfinder's Crest. Uh, this is just a bad card. It's for draft. I give it a one. Amplifying Arrow. Currently, I think it's too cute. Uh, I don't know if like go super tall with your amplifying arrow pump it up a bunch and it goes crazy uh it's worth it maybe in like a azalea dominate deck this could be crazy um i'm sure there's some way that you can just go stupid with amplifying arrow in, in an azalea deck but i don't know if that currently exists and uh, if it is i don't know how good it's even going to be so i'm just going to give it a fringe obviously on rate it's pretty bad zero for two damage it's not great on its own so it's going to need some highly synergistic effects to make it worth it. Barbed Undertow, though, is quite good. This is one of the reasons you would play aim counters. Uh, one for five, pretty good rate. And uh, if it has an aim counter, it has when this hits, choose red, yellow, or blue. Until the start of your next turn, your opponent can't pitch cards of that chosen color. So often you'll choose blue. I guess against Dromai, you'll choose red. And then <laughs> Prism, you would choose yellow. But uh, against most decks, you're probably picking blue. And that's just eliminating their efficiency, right? Like now they're not able to pitch blue cards and that makes their whole game plan way less efficient. And if they're like a blue based deck like Rain, uh, like Guardian or Icelander, they are really out of that, that turn cycle. So pretty good card. Um, I think most of his traps here, we've got Riptide's legendary traps, his specializations. Um, they're all quite good. That's probably why they're legendary because they're all pretty insane. Buzzsaw trap, uh, you know, if it's defending an attack with power greater than its base, it can't gain power this turn, and its power becomes its base. So, you know, if you're blocking something that has a big, even against, like, let's say they E-Strike, right? They E-Strike give it plus two. This basically is blocking five, because it puts it down to five power, five power, and then it blocks three. So now you're only taking two damage. You blocked five, basically, with one card, and Riptide will trigger and deal one damage. So this one card did six points of value against their E-Strike. Very, very good there. And that's just like a weaker example. It can get better than that. But the legendary ones, they're legendary for a reason. If you could play three of each of these, then Riptide would be really busted. But you only can play one of each, and uh, you can't get them back with like, you know, rem Remembrance or anything because they are not actions. So that's what that is. Collapsing Trap here, another busted one. You know, if you're defending an attack with Go again, they discard their hand and draw many mi that many minus one, which is just wild. Um, once again, Legendary, I mean, only get to play one of it, but when it goes off, this card will be crazy strong. Spike Pit Trap, probably the weakest. This is the kind that cares about activating a reaction or playing a reaction. Not that many decks do reaction stuff, and if they do reaction stuff, most of them only do it every once in a while. So this is the most situational one. Um, and so it gets a three because it's a blue three block, so it can't be that bad. But you'll definitely play it in uh, in Riptide. Like, every Riptide's going to play one of each of the legendaries, but it's certainly the weakest of the three. 
Melting Point gets a three for playable, mostly because it blocks for three. Um, the effect is like pretty mid. There's not many that um, not not that many decks that have one-handed weapons with one base power. It's like as far as I can think of right now, it's just Assassin and uh, Ninja, um, and they have ways to get them back now, right, with their Majestic. But you know, it's a one for four that blocks three. That's good enough. I think you'll play it just for that. Who cares about the effect? Um, Boulder Trap. This one gets a four. Uh, it's a yellow. That's not that bad. Um, yellow is nice because for most of the rangers, you can do your game plan off of a yellow, pitching one resource for your bow and then the second resource for a one cost arrow. A lot of arrows are one cost or a zero cost, so yellow gets you there for most arrows in the game. Um, and it has a nice effect. When it defends an attack with power greater than its base, it puts a minus one counter on an equipment the attacking hero controls. I have been told this is good into Oldham because you can... Uh, block like Titan's Fist, trigger effect, put a minus one counter on Rampart. That's pretty nice. So Guardians will probably, like all of them will just have to start running uh, start running Stalagmite into Ranger. Like that's the fix, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but the effect is still pretty nice because it will do a damage when it triggers from Riptide and the effect is also kind of dealing one damage. So uh, it's kind of a zero for five, that's pretty good. Pendulum Trap is the weakest of these yellow trap, uh, yep, rare yellow traps. This one is, a, once again, one that cares about reactions, which are not that common. This also is a mill one, and I don't think we're a fatigue deck. At least that's not what I can think of. Because of how rangers don't have weapons, it sounds a little difficult to be a fatigue deck. Um, so this one just gets a two for fringe. Tarpet Trap is another really good trap here. If it's defending an attack with go again, the next time an attack action hits this turn, it doesn't trigger really good uh you know once again it's a zero for four points of value because it'll block three and then deal one um but gets even more value if you can prevent like a snatch from hitting so pretty good effect there i do want to mention that these traps only deal the damage when their effect is fulfilled right like they have to trigger if tar pit trap is not blocking an attack with go again it has not triggered and riptide's ability won't deal damage it's just a three block which is still fine like blocking for three isn't the end of the world but you do have to actually make the effect go off to deal the damage with Riptide. Next, we've got Fletch a Red Tail. This is, uh, I mean, there's the whole cycle here. I do think it's really cool how they did the cycle with uh, the different arts and the different names for each color. Um, this card's fine. It's a playable. One for four is nice. It has an okay uh, effect with aim counters. It's fine. It doesn't block for three, so I don't like that as much as Melting Point, um, but it has like kind of a better effect. And the blue is probably pretty nice. Next, we've got the Lace cards. These cards are all pretty nice. Uh, Lace with Blood Rot is basically a 0 for 5. These feel like very, very similar to the stealth versions of these cards because they're also 0. They also do 3 and then have the same on hit. The only difference is that these are non-attacks that buff an arrow, and they only block 2. Um, but they're all pretty good. Blaze with Blood Rot, basically a 0 for 5 here. Frailty once again gets the slightly weaker score because I'm not as high on frailty tokens. And then Inertia, this card sounds like it's going to be really annoying for Icelander. Um, so I'll give this one a 4. Falcon Wing is nice because most Rangers can't easily get go again. And this is like a nice 0 for 3 go again. Infecting Shot is basically a 1 for 7. So uh, I like that rate a lot. I'll give it a 3 for playable. And then my card, Merkmeyer Grapnel, is a, a 0 for 4. Doesn't have like a great on hit or anything um but zero for four is like a fine rate and uh i like that you can use an aim counter to give it the plus one just like infecting shot and just like falcon wing if you ever get those extra resources it's just like whenever you have extra floating you can just convert it into extra damage which is pretty nice sedation shot here gets a four love giving those inertias just like the blood rot one before it it's kind of like one for seven in value Skybound Shot gets a 2, mostly because like 1 for 5 is a fine rate, just like the previous ones, but this one is just weaker, right? It just has no on hit. It's just like a strictly worse Sedation Shot. Um, then we've got Spire Sniping. I like this one. I give it a 3 for playable because of the synergy with Azalea specifically. Um, if you, you know, put it in your arsenal, you can use its effect to opt, basically. Um, not really opt because you can't put them on the bottom. Um, but then you can use Azalea's effects to put Spire Sniping on the bottom and get a card from the top into your arsenal with Dominate. Basically, just synergy there is why it gets a 3. I don't think it's good for any of the other rangers, but it has pretty nice Azalea synergy, so I'll give it a 3. Widowmaker 
is uh, basically just a draft card. And Classic Constructed, for the most part, uh, this says if they defend with fewer than two cards, it has plus three, but cards count equipment. So they can just block with like their Battleborn equipment or their Snapdragon scalers or whatever. And it just loses its effect. And then it's really below rate because it's just a one for four at that point. So uh, the fact that equipment count as cards kind of kills this on site. Just gets a one for unplayable. And then Withering Shot, once again, frailties are a little weaker, but still a fine effect. And it'll get a three for playable. Um, On to hybrid cards now. We've got the Assassin Ninja cards. Flick Knives gets a 2. Uh, this effect is currently bugged on Talishar, so at first I thought it was better than it is. Um, but the way that your daggers work for Assassin, if they've already blocked the cards, it doesn't actually decrease their value, like their defensive value retroactively. It's just like the next time they defend. So this doesn't have any synergy with the Assassin daggers. Um, it doesn't really have much synergy at all with any of the current weapons. It's just a way to like destroy your weapon and get some unblockable damage in. Um, and it blocks for one. It's fine. Like it's, it's not that great. As far as I know, I don't think it's gonna see a ton of play. But I'll give it fringe because there's maybe something I don't realize. The other two equipment are just for limited. They just get a one. I don't think they're very playable. Stab wound here gets a three for playable. It's pretty nice. It's a blue that's a three block. And then later in the game, when you are like down to adjust blues. You can attack with your daggers twice, and then if they both hit, then this hits. It's like a 0 for 4, which is pretty good turning a blue 3 block into a 0 for 4. I'll give it playable. Concealed Blade is even better. This is a basically better lunging press for Assassin and Ninja. It's a 0 for 3, um, or 0 cost blue 3 block is what I meant, which is pretty good, 0 cost blue 3 block. And it has the effect of giving an Assassin or Ninja uh, attack action card plus 1 power. The on hit doesn't really matter, but the plus one power is really nice. And then we've got knives out here. Um, giving your daggers plus one usually only translates to two damage, right? And uh, using one card for two damage isn't great. I'm giving it a two still just because it is a, once again, a blue three block. Rounding this out, we've got bleed out. This card will get a fringe score still. I almost gave it unplayable, but uh, if you hit with your first dagger, it becomes a 1 for 4 go again, which is like leg tap, it's not that bad. Um, but you do have to like hit with your daggers, and a lot of the daggers aren't that efficient. There's better things you can do in ninja for sure. And then for assassin, there's probably still better things you can do. Curl is probably only going to be played in assassin, but I'll give it a playable score because assassin doesn't have that many ways to go again. And uh, 0 for 3 is like good enough. Like head jab is probably fine for assassin. Plunge, I'm going to give it just a 2 again because it does cost 1. So it's a 1 for 3 go again. It has an okay on hit, but assassin, like ninja's definitely not playing this. And then assassin doesn't really want to swing their daggers that much. So the effect is not that great either. So I'm just going to give it a 2. Hurl is definitely better. Um, and then short and sharp, giving it a 1. It's just especially in CC, obviously, which is what we're talking about, like way, way worse Razor Reflex. And so I don't ever see this making it into the deck. Moving on to the Assassin and Ranger cards. Um, we've got a limited only, basically, headpiece here, giving it a one. Toxic Tips, though, I actually think is pretty good, um, mostly because Assassin and Ranger both don't have, like, amazing arm pieces. They have, like, okay arm pieces. Um, and this can just be a like iron rod basically with a blade break or the fact that when you pay the resource your next attack gets that nice on hit but you don't decide on the token until it hits which is kind of taking some information away from your opponent and the tokens can be pretty good in certain matchups so i think the effect is pretty nice actually and i can see this seeing play i'll give it playable um the codexes i really really like these are, I wish I could play these in my Briar decks. Like, I really wish I could play these in Briar. Um, they're basically like Gorganian Tomes because they are zero cost non attacks that draw a card. They draw the card at the end of turn because they make a ponder token, but they also disrupt your opponent somehow by making them mess with their arsenal in a way that they weren't planning on. And they give your opponent one of the like plagues without them being able to interact, right? So, like, Codex of Blood Rot. Each hero puts a card from their hand face down into their arsenal. So your opponent has to arsenal card if they don't have one. And now they're only down to three cards to block with, which is pretty good for you. 
Then you get a Ponder token. So once again, this is this card's replacing itself at the end of turn, and they get a Blood Rot. So this is dealing two damage, drawing you a card, and potentially disrupting your opponent's hand. All pretty good. Codex of Frailty, once again, kind of the weaker ones just because of how Frailty works. The effect is pretty nice getting to pick an attack action from your graveyard and putting it into your arsenal. Um, it's nice that it's making your opponent do the same thing and discarding a card, but uh, I'm not as high on Frailty. Inertia, once again, I think is going to be pretty nice. Um, I think this card's a four just because of the Icelander matchup. You gotta just give Icelander an Inertia. They have no way to respond to it. And the fact that they have to put the top card of their deck into their arsenal, if they like get caught off guard and have to do this effect, they could potentially get something really bad into their arsenal that they have trouble getting out. Like, what if they just put Heart of Fiendal face down into their arsenal? They lose the arsenal the rest of the game. <laughs> like, you can really disrupt them here. And I think this card's really good specifically into Icelander, but because of how good Icelander is right now, I'm going to give it a four. Death Touch, I'm also going to give a four here. Uh, one for, I mean, it has the, the downside that it can't be played from hand. So for Assassin and Ranger, mostly that just means for Arsenal. Obviously, Azuri can use it with her effect. Um, but one for six, really good rate. And the on hit of making a token, a plague token under your opponent's control, really good as well. Once again, just like Toxic Tips, you don't choose until it hits. So you can wait till it hits. You get all this information about how your opponent blocks, what they're thinking, and then you pick. If they're keeping all their cards, maybe you can pick Inertia. If they wanted to block a little, you can pick Blood Rot just for the damage. You get so much information first. Toxicity also gets a four. Um, it's just a zero for five. Obviously it has to hit and you probably will sideboard this out against decks that want to block you out. But if you're against a deck that doesn't like blocking any kind of aggro deck, this is often just going to be zero for five damage, which is really, really above rate. Brilliant Touch is going to get a one. Uh, it's a 0 for 4 that has like no good on hit. If they're blocking it, they get a Blood Rot, but they can just not block it, and then it's not that good. I guess the idea is you sneak it out with a Zuri, but even then, like, you're just sneaking out 4 damage? I don't know. It's not great. I don't really like this card. I'm going to give it unplayable. And then we've got the traps here. Blood Rot, like you've seen before, the reaction traps I think are the weakest, so I'm just going to give this one a 2. I'm going to give Frailty Trap a 4, I think this is the best of these actually because it interacts with go again really good into aggro decks because it's going to uh you know block for four or three deal one damage to your opponent assuming they're blocking a go again and it gives them a frailty token which against a lot of aggro decks they're using their weapon and often using their weapon near the end of the chain so you're able to decrease the power of their weapon by one so now it's blocking basically five total points of value by blocking three blocking one later and dealing one to your opponent Inertia Trap's pretty good as well. Um, not quite as good as Frailty, but I don't think Inertia Trap's bad either. On to the generics, finally. Going to finish out the video at around an hour. Probably my longest video I'll ever put out, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. I appreciate you getting this far. Let's hop into the generics here at the end. We've got Vambrace of Determination. This is probably just going to be played by like ninjas or assassins who want to get around crown of seeds i don't know who else is going to play this really but it's probably pretty good in decks that want to get around crown of seeds um so i'll give it a three just because of crown of seeds hate it's good by me secret the next all of these ones are just for limited basically they're not playable in classic instructed fleet foot sandals i'll give it a two there's some stuff it the fact that it only cares about one base power means you have some maybe cute synergy with something that has like one base power but gets a huge bump and it can give that go again even if it doesn't cost one so maybe sometimes it's a better snapdragon scalers but it's mostly going to be a weaker snapdragon scalers but i'll give it a two for niche amnesia gets a three mostly because it blocks three i don't love the effect here um uh, but two for six block three is pretty nice and against some heroes uh making it so that they like lose names on everything can be nice if they have stuff that interacts with each other is like really really stupidly strong against katsu so if katsu becomes really good this will be annoying for him but for most heroes i don't think it's going to matter too much down and dirty we've got some fives on this page i think this is the first time we've had fives twice on the same screenshot some really good generic majestics this set down and dirty 
is a five because of Illusionist. This card can be blocked with from your arsenal. And often when you're an aggro deck that is having trouble with Illusionist, you're gonna play extra poppers. And then during that game, you're gonna have that CNC in hand and your opponent is not gonna attack with anything with Phantasm and you're gonna arsenal that CNC or attack with it. And now you're like, that sucks. That was one of my only six poppers. Don't worry about that anymore. Arsenal the down and dirty. And later on, you just save it there. Later on, when they attack with their popper, boom, down and dirty comes out of Arsenal and pops it. Huge buff against Illusionist. Really nice into Dromai. And we know there is a new Light Illusionist coming out in, I believe, July in the new supplemental set. So this is a bit of a preemptive five. Maybe not as strong right now with only one Illusionist, but we are seeing a new Illusionist with all the auras and everything coming out in July, and I expect Down and Dirty to be even better then. So I would definitely pick up three copies when the set comes out, because it's just gonna get better as more and more illusionists come out. Give and take, I'll give it a three for playable. It is a one for three that blocks three, that's fine. It has go again. It's like a weak leg tap, but a leg tap that blocks three. And it has an okay effect if your opponent defends it, but often, unless you're applying an on hit to it, often your opponent's not gonna defend it and just take three. Gore Belching gets a one. This is a card that doesn't block. <laughs> it's a zero for seven. And if it like you're playing two of them and you hit another Gore Belching, it's just a zero for zero that doesn't block either. I feel like it's way too swingy. And maybe there's a way to break it so it's just a zero for seven. Like if you hit a Phoenix Flame, you're the coolest player in the world. You're so epic. You just played the zero for seven. But the odds of hitting that Phoenix Flame, unless you're able to perfectly put it on top, Maybe if there's a deck that can do that, like maybe if there's a deck that uh, manipulates their deck so they're putting zeros or ones on tops, this can be a bit better. But until I see that deck, I'm just going to give it a one. Maybe I should give it a two. I'll give it a two. We'll say a 1.5 or a two, because maybe you can manipulate your deck like that. But mostly I'm just going to give it a one. Burdens of the past. I think Dorinthia is back. She was kind of back. Josh Lau was nuts. He can go 8-0 with her in the meta, right? But now Josh Lau is unburdened by burdens of the past five because oh my god this card is a zero cost blue that blocks three and it says until end of turn target hero can't play defense reactions with the same name as a card in their graveyard and the end game dorinthia just says you can't use the reacts this turn i'm gonna go crazy like you you, you say okay i'm dorinthia i'm blah I'm, you, know, you you can't use the reacts this turn I'm going to attack here. Oh, you're going to give me your whole hand? Twinning Blade. <laughs> now you're dead. <laughs> like, it. this is going to be so big for Dorinthia and possibly for other decks too. Not that not many decks care about D-Reacts as much as Dorinthia. This is a five for Dory, and it's going to be really annoying for any decks that used to block her out, like Guardians. You're just going to have a lot of trouble now in the late game. Dory's playing all three of these as her blues, and you're going to struggle. If I, At first, I was kind of excited about this in Rune Blade, like, in Briar because it draws a card as well at some point, but you're probably never going to play against someone as Briar who's playing 10 D-Reacts unless they're like Riptide. Um, but in Dorinthia, it's nuts. And having a way to counteract, like block out D-React decks now is huge for the meta. And then Premeditate maybe should also have a five. They basically reprinted Plunder Run. Like this is a zero cost. Go again. Your next attack action from Arsenal gets plus three. So you play this from hand, your Arsenal attack gets plus three. And then the next time an attack action hits this turn, you get a Ponder token. That's for the whole turn, just like Plunder Run was. I know people are already calling this card Ponder Run because Ponder tokens are just you drawing a card. Obviously it's weaker than Plunder Run because you draw at the end of your turn, but you're still drawing a card. Come on, this is a free three damage if you can get a card to hit because it's replacing itself. I love free three damage. This card's a four. I'll give it a 4.5. Big buff for Briar, probably for aggro decks in general. This card's huge. Very good Majestic. Very, very good generic Majestics this set, if you can't tell. I mean, I think this is all of them. I think this is the six. About half of these are meta defining a little and some way or the other. All right, now let's zoom through the rest. Humble is okay. It's a two for six. Got a nice on hit, only blocks two. Infectious Host. It's garbage. It's a two. It's a zero for four that you don't ever use. You really care about the effect. It's a one. I'm not gonna see this card. Looking for a scrap. One for five. Go again. Sometimes I like that. I'll give it a fringe playable. Wreck havoc. This is just bad CNC. Unless you need more copies, you're not gonna play it. Just a two. Cut down to size. 
pretty good. Two for six that your opponent basically has to block if they haven't blocked yet that turn. So good into aggro. I'll give it playable. Destructive Deliberation. When it hits, it makes a ponder. That's not bad. But it's not great either. It's only a two for five that blocks two. I'll give it a fringe. Feisty Locals. I kind of like this card. It's a zero for three. And it makes your opponent not want to block it. Because then it gets plus two. So like you can give it cool on hits. Like the Premeditate. I kind of like that. So I'm going to give it a two. It might be better than I think. Freewheeling Renegades though. Opposite. Your opponent just gets a bonus by blocking it. Hate that. One. Spring Load. Also a one. It's a one for five. That's not that bad, but it has nothing going else for uh, nothing else going for it. It's got the periphery. I'll give it a two. Maybe it should be a three because it is kind of just a zero for three, but it's definitely weaker than premeditate by a lot. And I don't think you're going to be playing both. Brush off gets a three. It's playable because I think aggro decks would rather play this as their one of into Kano than Oasis Respite because it doesn't cost them a resource, and they can just arsenal it, go off into the Kano, and then when the Kano goes for Wildfire, you can just throw the brush off at it, and you should just be brushing it off. Peace of Mind gets a three, mostly just for Oldham. I think everyone expected this one. This card's been revealed for a while. Pretty good synergy with Oldham. I'll give it a three. I think that is everything. <laughs> I know it was a long video. I tried to speed it up near the end. We went just over an hour. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave in the comments if you liked this video. Should I probably do it in two parts next time? Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, and I'll see you next time.